Sarah Thompson is a games industry veteran and leader with a long career working at companies such as Iugo, Gree, PlayStation, Google, and most recently at Bad Robot Games. She is an extremely thoughtful, experienced, and optimistic female leader who has achieved a lot of success in an otherwise male-dominated industry. I am someone who has really stumbled when it comes to achieving diversity in the teams and companies I've been a part of, or even knowing how to talk about it without offending people. Today, I'm very excited to have a real discussion with Sarah and to learn from her how I can stop making so many mistakes and to discuss diversity in as real of a conversation as possible. Hence, we will be talking about dealing with diversity and in the context of the current market environment. The world is changing. We are in the midst of a potentially prolonged global recession. In Silicon Valley, layoffs are hitting virtually every major tech company as we enter the end of the age of excess and enter the age of efficiency. And amidst all of this, game studios need to learn how to navigate the new waters. Stay tuned for a very real discussion that I hope can help many of you rethink your approach to not only female diversity, but even diversity more broadly at your company. Stay tuned for Sarah Thompson. Okay, Sarah, well, uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining. I thought we could start just by talking about kind of a sensitive issue, but is someone like me who's basically grown up a nerd all of my life, I've been socially awkward for basically my entire life. And still today, I think I'm pretty pretty awkward socially, but as like a male executive or leader or manager, I, I'm kind of perplexed about how to treat women. And just to be more specific and to give you a more specific example, I think just the reality is, at least for me, the way that I treat men versus women is different. So for example, you know, if I'm here in the US, I might go out shooting guns with a coworker or we could casually go out to dinner or have drinks pretty casually. And I'm just going to be honest here that I sometimes do tell pretty crude jokes with some folks who are male, but you better believe if there's like a, like a female, ex even an executive or, or leader, I probably would not be saying those same jokes in front of the female lead or employee or things like that. And so I wanted to ask you in terms of when it comes to these you know, these interpersonal relationships or the things that we say, I wanted to ask you about what's the line and how do we as male executives, leaders, managers, create bonds with other coworkers or, or leaders without things just being super awkward or people feeling weird? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a great question. I love that you're starting with this. First of all, thanks for having me. It's it's awesome to, to be a part of this. and. I'm really um, super thankful that you're even having this dialogue. So like, first off, kudos to you that that you're opening up this conversation. And I feel like that's a really important first step to acknowledge because I think a lot of, there's a lot of fear around having these kind of discussions. Mm -hmm. And that's a real, we're doing ourselves a disservice by not even having the conversations. So I just want to say that right off the bat. And I also want to state that I am by no means an expert in this area. I'm, I'm not someone whose job is to focus on DEIA work um, or uh, unconscious bias work or any of that. I do my own work around that. And I'm one of many perspectives and, ex and someone who has my own experience in games. So I just want everyone to think about their own experiences and their own perspectives and that there's there's a lot of different angles to this conversation and like right. we're not going to have enough time to dig it we're going to be scratching the surface today right. on this so just just wanted to preface that so to address your question i think that a reframing of of what you were saying around how do we you know avoid mistakes how do we stop from feeling awkward that's going to happen. Like, first of all, let's normalize <laughs> that. Yeah. Let's normalize that like, we're going to say stupid shit sometimes. Right. We're going to be unskilled sometimes. We're going to say things that unintentionally could be harmful to others. And the key for me 
and I think for a lot of other people in the space is just being willing to be open to hearing when that might be the case. I think we go in with a lot of assumptions around how to behave and not how to behave. And it's changing rapidly too. Like things that I said five years ago, I probably would be cringing at today. And I think that's a good thing. That means that if you're cringing from what you've said a few years ago, that means you're evolving and that that's part of the human experience is to understand that the world is changing quite rapidly. So I would say, you know, this, this is, this is a not to get it right. I, I'm my goal and all of our goals should be greater understanding, empathy towards other people, understanding other people's perspective, asking questions, bringing curiosity because we tend to want to shut down. We tend to want to get to a place of defensiveness. And I think leaders who are really bringing a lot of awareness and emotional intelligence into their, into their roles and you know accountability, right? This is about being accountable as a leader because you're playing a really important role for the team and setting a standard and modeling this kind of behavior is that desire to learn, bringing humility, bringing curiosity and wanting to build that greater understanding. And I mean, listen, I, I, you live on the other side of the world. I'd love to hear like what's been your experience in terms of, you know, living in a very different country in India and, and that's culturally quite different than from the U S and has its own challenges around caste system and things like that. I'd love to hear, you know, what's, what's been your experience with that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, well, there, there's a lot of things that go through my head as, as you know, you, you were speaking, but maybe uh, just, just to answer your question about India, I, I would say that, you know, I've been, I've been very surprised at just how friendly the people are in India. And I think it is a very open and accepting environment, at least from, from the perspective that, um, or the experience that I've had in India so far. And I've just been... Um, I don't think that I've really experienced anything with respect to like cat, the caste system and things like that. I um, maybe it's just under the surface and I just haven't seen it. But um, as far as I know, we've been able to hire a lot of folks. And um, as far as I know, there hasn't been any, at least outward, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of like outward things that are visible to me where, where that has come into play. But that could just be because I, I haven't seen it. I also like in, you know, the Japanese have like this concept of what they call tatemai, which is like the outward external sort of like perception that you, you give to um, other people. Um, it may also just be that so far I haven't been able to crack through like that, the exterior of, um, of Indian culture and of some of my coworkers. But I will say that I think that a lot of the people who um, we have at our company, I, I actually, you know, I mean, I think of them as family. And I, I think that um, in terms of like some of the, I, I will say we have a problem with diversity in, in India because mm -hmm. I would say that, um, you know, the, uh, in, you know, specific, with respect to female diversity there, I just haven't seen a whole lot, but I would say otherwise, the work environment has been somewhat similar, uh, you know, nuances and differences between India and the U.S. But um, from a diversity perspective, I would say we have a lot of the same problems. And I'm not sure how to crack some of those problems. And, you know, similar to, 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 to here in the U.S., like if we have um, a female employee, and I, I can kind of go into some of the things that we've tried to do to increase diversity in India, but it's it's been difficult. And I would even say maybe even more pronounced in certain disciplines like engineering, where it's just been very difficult to be able to find um, diverse candidates for certain roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but may maybe like a couple of other points just to follow on to the original question that I could ask you um, is, is first, uh, when it does come to whether it's like some of the things that we say, whether it's like, you know, um, certain 
jokes or invitations to, I don't know, like, you know, I, I, know, I mean, shooting guns is kind of like a weird example, but like if it's something else, you know, and it's, it's a male executive to, an, to another executive who may be female or, you know, even a, a manager to a direct report, wh when, when you think about male to male versus male to female, you know, are, are there things that you think we should be more careful about? Um, because I kind of feel on, on the one side, you know, my brain says, Hey, everyone in the company should be the same. So if, if I'm going to, if I'm going to invite Bob out to a drink, I should invite Jill out to a drink. But then, but then I also think, ah, oh, that's kind of dangerous. I probably don't want to do that just in case. So I, I, I don't know, like how, how should we be thinking about things like that? Hmm. I would say there's been changes in, in my 15 plus years in games that I've witnessed mm -hmm. okay. over time. So I would say, I remember like in the first few years of in games, it was pretty normal for people to be attending conventions and a group of most likely guys suggesting let's go to the strip club right? Like that was yeah. a very normalized thing in the tech industry and certainly not very inclusive. Um, and yeah. I remember hearing a lot of men who were not comfortable with that and they kind of felt like they had to go along because that was part of the relationship building aspect mm -hmm. of that business deal. Um, so I would say that there are probably a number of things that we're evolving out of that were normal five years ago. Um, right. Even the, you know, very alcohol centric. Um, I mean, societies in general, right? Like right. most societies, alcohol is is very centered as part of um, you know relaxation, bonding, connection. And again, I don't think that that's exclusive to women necessarily feeling uncomfortable. I think there's there's people in general who don't particularly want to engage in alcohol. But I think that it's about, again, it's about creating an environment where how do you, how do you do an activity or how do you have some kind of um, meeting dynamic, let's say mm -hmm. that it, it's, it, there's optionality, right? There's, there's right. a way for, for everyone to feel welcome <clears throat> for the environment to feel safe. So I think it's about that consideration and thinking about like, it's not necessarily gender based, but, and you know, sometimes it is, uh, is how do we create an environment where it's like, yeah, maybe some people might want to drink and then other people don't, but like, how, do, how does everyone feel welcomed and, and like they belong in that kind of environment? And yeah. I think too, um, it's a great opportunity to check our own egos, right? We get attached to um, belief systems. And that that's the other thing is like, that's part of the sensitivity that comes up around this is, is people feel um, like they're being attacked or that there's, there's something that's personally being pointed out to them that they're yeah. doing wrong. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is, is that we all have our own implicit bias. We all have our belief systems and there's an identity attachment to that. Right. So it's an opportunity yeah. for us to bring that humility and say, you know, why am I so, why do I feel so strongly that it needs to be this kind of scenario or it needs to be in this environment? And is there a way to do this um, where everyone feels comfortable or that there's some kind of level of safety being created um, and, and giving that opportunity? And also, too, like, not making assumptions. Like I, I think, yeah. you know, I ride motorcycles. That's a very male dominated activity. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would have not expected that something that I enjoy or that they would talk motorcycles with me. So like also there's sort of gender bias in our assumptions around what people are interested in or not. So yeah, it's again, it's about curiosity, not making assumptions, bringing humility and, and just being willing to, to, to listen to people. Right. Yeah. The, the, the second kind of follow-up that I wanted to ask you about is this notion around um, 
I don't know, may, maybe call it safety or just, just like being open. Because I do think like if I were to think about it from both sides, uh, from the perspective of, let's say, um, a female employee or leader and maybe a, a male leadership team of some kind that is creating an environment. I, I feel like there has to be, um, in my in my opinion, I would hope that there would be openness on both sides, meaning that from the perspective of um, if you do have a male leadership team, that you create an environment where t- to, to the point that you make, there there's more optionality. It's not like, hey, we're all going to go to the strip club or we're going to do this. There's like more options for people to build bonds and to create an environment where uh, that leadership team helps empower female employees or leaders to say, hey, you know what? I don't like this event. It's not cool. I'd rather have something else. And where that male leadership team would be like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, let's, let's, let's figure something else out that makes more sense. But then also on the other side, I, I do also feel like, and I especially felt this when I was in LA, where there was almost like this um, police attitude, like, I'm going to get you. If you say anything that's out of, out, of, out, of the, out of line with this specific narrative, then I'm going to try and attack you and kill you. Um, and I really got that sense where it wasn't about intent. It was really about you make a mistake and I'm going to try and crucify you. And I really felt that that was really like, I, it just really turned me off to the fact that like there is. And so that's why, you know, guys like me are kind of afraid. We're not going to, you know, in that kind of environment, we would never, ever even like, you know, whether it's it's a joke or saying, hey, you want to grab dinner real quick or anything like that to a female ex- you know, executive, we would never do that just because now it's like, okay, I, I, I don't I don't want to get like insta canceled. But it does seem like if there was a little bit more um, you know, uh, a little bit more from the male leadership side, if 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 it is a male leadership team to create more of an open environment and to create that optionality to try and make things more inclusive. And from the other side, to just try to understand that, you know, even like nobody's perfect and that really trying to understand the intent. Why did somebody say something or, you know, um, make a comment? And then if you point out that mistake, I think, you know, for me, I know I'm an idiot. Like I, I say a lot of dumb stuff all the time. And, but if it's pointed out to me, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, that was dumb. I'll, I'm going to change. Right. But it, it and so I don't know, what, what, what do you think about that? And would you agree with my assessment of, of kind of like, you know, try, trying to get both sides to be a little bit more open? Yeah, there, I, I think that's, I think you've hit on some, you've hit on a few really important points there. There, things have been operating in such a way for so long. And with many industries, let's, talk about tech and games because that's what we're in. There's been a reckoning over several years, right? I mean, Gamergate, it's been a few years since right. Gamergate these days. So I think there's been a lot of really bad behaviors, unskilled behaviors, harmful behaviors that have been occurring in the gaming space for a really long time. And it's being brought out of the shadows. So that's Fantastic. That's how things change, right? Is when they live in the shadows, it continues to fester. So as things are being brought out and people are speaking out, underrepresented groups are are speaking out around treatment, abuse, harmful behaviors, the pendulum does tend to swing. And we saw this with the Me Too movement. We saw this around a lot of different um, um, reckonings that have been happening these days is the pendulum can swing in the opposite direction where there's a bit of a, um, um, let's say like a, a militancy around it or um, an extremism mentality around it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also harmful, to be honest. I think that there, there needs to be that kind of space like we were talking about earlier. There needs to be room for people to make mistakes 
as long as there's the desire to learn from those mistakes, that's, right. you know, discernment's important here. Accountability needs to be present and room for discussion needs to be present. Um, there's actually a great book. I'm, it's on my reading list. I haven't read it yet, but I, I listened to a podcast um, around the author. So the book is called The Persuaders and um, it's Anand uh, Gerdadas who wrote it. And this is a book that talks about in depth around how we're really going to create tide change in society around racism, misogyny, the things that persist everywhere and that it, we need to give it the time and the space to do that. There's new language that's been created um, mm -hmm. around, you know, gender fluidity. There's new language created around um, race-based discussions and we can't expect everyone to be fluent in that right. overnight. Right. So I think giving, giving people the time and the chance to learn that and understanding that it's also very situational in terms of what part of the world you live in culturally, there's cultural nuances around this as well that we need to be really sensitive to. And, you know, we don't like that as humans, right? We don't like the complexity. We don't like the fact that it isn't this sort of nice little neat simple thing to learn and that's part of the discomfort around learning this is that right. there's a lot of complexity <clears throat> to this so i think needing to, to know that and not sort of jumping to that punishment or using shame as a weapon like weaponizing shame i think is a big mistake right i think calling people out in a in a not an emotionally led way <laughs> anchored in, 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 um, in sort of knowledge and, uh, groundedness is going to be much more effective and produce a lot better results with people than lashing out and leading with anger and leading with shame. I think that's, right. that's not going to be the best way. Yeah. Cause I, I think to your point, it doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to be a situation where things are so emotionally charged and there's like this anger that everyone has. And I'll give you a very specific example where I, I screwed up. Okay. So I was in LA and, and I was like, you know what we're doing here, this is retarded. And then there was just like this, <gasps> and then, you know, what the fuck, you know, and, and like people just got so upset and they're like, you cannot use that word. And it was just like, I was just like, okay, you, you want to just explain? Like, like, let me understand. Okay. If I'm, I don't have to use that word, just like calm down, everybody <laughs> relax. Uh, and then like two days later, there was a female exec and we were in a room and she's like, oh, this is retarded. I was like, oh, you know what? Actually, you're, you're not supposed to learn that word. I, I, you're not supposed to use that word. I just learned two days ago. And it was just <laughs> like a, it was, it was just a really calm conversation, right? And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. So I do think like there are situations where if people just like try to understand intent, like we, like some of us really aren't using specific words or trying to hurt someone or trying to kill somebody. And like, you, we don't, you don't have to crucify us in order to, you know, in order to get change to happen. If, if we understand, oh, this specific word or doing something in a specific way is hurting people, obviously we don't want to do that. So I do think to your point, if, if people could just be a little bit more open-minded and just trying to understand what was the intention, was the intention of this person to try to hurt somebody or were they just making an honest mistake? And then we can just talk about it. And I, I think a lot of these things could be um, handled in a very <laughs> calm way if, if people just, you know, <laughs> just calm down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think that again, every, we are all on a learning curve right, right now with this and that's a great thing and we need to make space for that. I also really want to give people the benefit of the doubt, like you said, is that the intention behind that is not harmful. And I think most, in most cases, that's true. And I also want, you know, part of my work around this too, is really understanding the other side of it around, and, and it's not about validating 
the behaviors, whether on either side of the extremism, but coming from a place of understanding of someone who has heard that kind of harmful speak directed at them for years, understanding the emotion behind it, right? right. And understanding yep. like, you know, listen, as a woman, I've heard many, many, for many, many years, you're too aggressive. I've heard from people for many, many years, you're too outspoken, like things like that, that probably mm. men would not hear. And so I think the emotion can come from a, a real honest place sometimes as well of, you know, I'm just, I'm sick of this shit. I'm sick of right. hearing this and I'm, and I'm losing my patience around right. it. Right. So again, it's, it's like this dance we're all doing all the time. And so I think that's why dialogues like this are so important because when you understand the deeper context where each person is coming from, that's where we move forward. That's where the conversation evolves. That's where someone, it's not just this, someone's telling me to do this because that's the right thing to do compared to, oh, I really understand this person's experience now. Right. That's really meaningful to me. Like I care about this person's well-being. That's a much more effective motivation for right. change. But Sarah, I do think like the point that you're raising to me is a little bit dangerous. Meaning like, so for example, if if I as a male executive box you into like, okay, a woman should be like this mm -hmm. rather than an executive should be like, like this. And I'm evaluating you as an executive rather than as a woman, because clearly if, if I'm just thinking about a specific role and what, like, you know, and if you've been in, you know, business development, dude, aggressiveness is number one. Like what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I do think that might be a little bit dangerous for some people to have these, um, sort of, you know, um, I, I don't know, kind of like these constraints around how people should act based upon the kind of person they are rather than based upon the role and what would make somebody effective in a role. But maybe I can ask you then, um, so based upon, like, let's say somebody is telling you, hey, Sarah, you're too, you're, you're being too aggressive, um, even though I would argue for for like a BD role, that's like potentially number one. Mm. In these kind of situations where there are um, biases or there there is there are things in the workplace that you're not comfortable with, can you talk to me about, or maybe you could also give advice to other uh, other people out there, whether they're female or not, how should they be giving feedback to those people? in a way that is constructive or that you think would be most effective? I would say it does go back to a lot of the foundational frameworks that we've been talking about here, which is, which is dialogue, right? And both, both sides need to be coming to the table with that desire to learn and curiosity, like the power of inquiry both with ourselves and within, you know, other dynamics with, with people, the interpersonal dynamics, it, it's nuanced, right? Like that's, that's sort of the, my easy answer here is it's nuanced and there's case by case situations around motivation, people's implicit bias, um, the situation, the, you know, everyone involved, like there, there's so many factors involved here. And I think the other part of this too, is there's often like no sort of nice little clean answer to that. There's often opposing truths happening within the human condition. <laughs> you know, we, we tend to contradict ourselves in, around um, around behaviors and personalities. And so this this is why this is a challenging kind of discussion, right? is is that right. there's pieces of this that's like, well, this there's this element here and this 
this fits into this kind of box and there's this element here and this fits into this kind of box and like they don't they 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 don't go together or they don't make sense together it's like well yeah welcome to being a human <laughs> So I know that sounds like a bit of a messy answer, but I feel like there's that that's that's part of what we're trying to navigate here. And and part of what being a skilled leader is about is knowing how to dance in that complexity and and right. really understand and do the best we can in that moment, right? Like I was saying before, like my my understanding and and um, knowledge of DEIA five years ago is very different than where it is now because I've done that work and I have the desire to co continuously learn. And that's the point, right, is, is to do that. So I think when you're approaching your manager or your boss and there was something that was said that felt um, sexist or limiting or, you know, the little slight hint of racism in there, depending on the person. Um, I, I think that having that kind of dialogue requires um, that motivation for greater understanding. Right. But if we were to keep it a little bit real here too, I like, I also think it also depends on the environment and the people, right? But because let, let, let's be real, there, there are jerk offs in life. <laughs> in working at companies. And maybe this jerk off is the person who is either harassing a female, uh, you know, employee or, you know, having um, limit, having biases that are limiting that, that person's advancement. And in some cases, going back to intent, maybe it's an, you know, uh, unconscious bias and the intent of that person is to actually get better. But there are, and I've seen numerous examples of executives where if they got critical feedback, they would take it very negatively and they might actually try to, you know, have some form of retribution given because they wouldn't want that feedback to get around and they would feel it's an attack. And so from that perspective, what, what do you think, Sarah? Like, I, you know, I really feel like that does put some female executives or employees in a very precarious situation, how would you advise somebody how to gauge that situation to try and make, you know, their work environment better? But if, you know, it kind of depends on who that person they're giving that feedback to is and like, how would you even gauge whether that person is somebody you should be giving feedback to? That's an excellent point you're bringing up here. And uh, thank you for bringing this up because I do think primarily people who are feeling that they're needing to point something out in that way that feels inequitable or harmful to them as an underrepresented person in games, your safety and your well being is number one. And so making that judgment call about whether or not this is going to produce a any kind of desirable outcome right. and be something that might actually get that kind of retaliation back on you. Um, that's a very real thing that many people have to consider. And it's, right. it sucks that that is the case. I've experienced that over the years. I definitely feel that there's been environments I've been in where something I have said has ended up being a CLM, a career limiting move. And that we still have so much work to do around right. that. And, and so it is that balance of making that personal decision around when to speak out, who to speak out to safety. And that's really a personal choice. That's, and I fully respect people who make that choice not to speak out because they don't feel safe. Right. That's a very, very real thing. But I, I think if we were to as, assign attribution of responsibility, though, I would probably say that if somebody isn't speaking out, it's most likely the fault of the leader to make sure that they make it clear through actions and, and through example 
that feedback is going to be safe. So, um, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've also seen cases where people are just too scared to say anything, even, even in a safe environment. But I, 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 if I were to, if I were to think, or if I were to put responsibility or, or the bulk of the responsibility on one side, I would probably say it's most likely, and I would say 80 to 90% of the responsibility should be on the, on the leadership teams to create that kind of environment where things are okay. Would, would you agree with that, Sarah? Oh, I completely agree with that. I think that it, it, the onus is on leadership. They're the ones who are creating that environment. Right. Uh, and, and culture, that's part of culture. That starts from the top. And yes, it permeates through the entire company. And, uh, and there has to be an awareness of how everyone is, is feeding into and supporting or not supporting that, that culture, that environment. And I think a, a really important lesson that I've learned recently is understanding that as a leader, if you're really committed to creating inclusivity, belonging, and safety, trust, all of those things that make a, a fantastic culture, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to actually feel safe. And you have to be right. okay with that because people are coming into the workplace with their own degrees of comfort and experiences and traumas. Right that we probably don't fully understand. And so we do our best to create a container for that, but don't expect everyone to feel safe. As long as you're doing the best you can and taking in feedback of how you can improve on that, I think that's that's the key. Got it. And maybe another question I can ask you just to kind of shift gears a little bit, but just when we look at the games industry overall, it's very male dominated. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you're, you've experienced this in your career, uh, you know, in the games industry, but I want to ask you in terms of like, when, when we think about the lack of diversity, why do you think there are so few females in the game development I industry? Oh gosh, we don't have enough time. What time yeah. is it? <laughs> we probably need um, a couple of days to really dig into this, but uh, yeah, let's let me let me attempt to tackle this. Gosh, I mean, there's so many layers to this, right? I think I think we need to think about uh, the, all of the layers to this. So, thinking about um, awareness. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lack of awareness in general around the opportunities in games, and it tends to appeal to and focus on men or young men who are coming up through school education. And I think there's a preconceived notion that the games industry is very tech, like, and yes, of course, tech is a huge part of it. But there's so many other elements and roles that are part of the games industry that don't have to be that tech-centric kind of um, role. So like for me, for example, I'm, I, I'm definitely not a tech person. I, can, I, ha I know enough tech to get by, but I'm, I'm business development. I am doing, um, I'm doing a very different element and side of games. There's marketing, there's community building, there's all these other pieces that I think there's just a lack of awareness around okay. that in this space. So how do we, so that's, so my question coming out of this, and this is probably what I'm going to do is like spin questions out of this of like, how could we approach this? How do we build that awareness in, uh, you know, schools or what have you of, hey, this is a space where there's a lot of opportunities for all sorts of people, not just dudes, right? right. So there's that. Um, I think safety is a really big piece, like we've been talking about around how do, you, how do you have an environment where women feel really motivated to join and that they're actually going to feel valued, that they feel like they can make an impact, they feel like they're going to belong. And like this heavy Venn diagram with, you know, gamers, right? right? There's big issues around 
women feeling safe to play online games. Um, so there's, there's a very similar kind of dynamic playing out there of like, how do we create an environment where women feel like, and, and, you know, people of all kinds who are not men, cis men is how do we make that a space that feels comfortable for everyone? Uh, yeah, I, I feel like then understanding different perspectives, right? How do we get, um, how do we get more, women actually feeling like they can speak up and start shaping the, the industry more feeling like they can make a bigger contribution around that. So I, I think there's, there's all of these pieces and like very systemic issues uh, that are slowly changing over time. That's the other thing too, is that we need to understand that like, this is going to take time, right? This is not something we're going to be able to just fix um, in a year or two that we need to we need to really be looking at the system overall and looking at how we're making these incremental changes that will lead to meaningful change down the road. Uh, and I think that's a big piece too, is having that sort of longer term thinking as opposed to the short sighted like things are broken now, right. fix, fix, fix. Like, no, let's let's think about how we're actually tackling this in a meaningful way. Okay. And maybe one other thing we could talk about related to this topic is also like the benefits of diversity, because I, I do think that this is something where, you know, I'm not sure if everybody realizes the advantage of having, you know, different perspectives help, helping as, as a benefit or advantage for a company and for our leadership team. And where my mind goes as a very specific example, is when I think about the GFC, the, the great financial crisis of 2008, then bas basically during that time, like essentially almost every bank failed or required a bailout from basically taking a bunch of super risky bets, investing in things like subprime mortgages, even when it was pretty obviously a really dumb thing to do. And one of the few banks to survive was actually the, the Bank of Iceland, which was led by a female CEO and female management team. And of that leadership team and of that bank, it was, it was said that that team, unlike bank leadership teams at, you know, at other, uh, other banks that were all male and really just like, we just got to make as much return as possible and just go, 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 drive, drive, forget about the risk and things like that. Um, but that team, you know, be because they were coming from a different, you know, kind of space and had a, a different perspective, they were able to avoid um, a pretty massive mistake that was, you know, that that many other male leadership teams fell into. Um, another example that comes to mind is just, um, you know, um, a number of years ago, I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco and meet with so, uh, some some leads at uh, Glue in San Francisco. And I noticed there were a lot more female leaders in that team and just walking around the cafeteria. It's like, oh, there's a lot of lot, lot more females here than I would expect in a typical gaming studio. And so it seems like, you know, at that company, they were able to find success with, you know, um, female based games or games that that were focused on female audience. But you would kind of think that you really shouldn't just need female employees or leads for female genre games. It, it should be more broadly applicable. And, you know, they, they did have good success with, with the number of games at that time. And so I was wondering if you could just comment on, you know, what your perspective is in terms of the benefits of diversity or having uh, maybe more specific to the female context, having more female leaders and executives in gaming studios. This is a really curious discussion slash debate to me because okay. I, I, I feel like games as an industry has this very interesting um, dichotomy of games that, that tend to be very focused and driven towards male gamers, mm -hmm. right? The typical like usual suspects that, that we can think of. Uh, the Call of Duty such and such like that. And then I think there's other games that maybe fall into that bucket of 50-50 um, uh, or more 
female um, or diverse gamers, like let's say a Candy Crush, um, for right. example. And that's the fascinating thing is that games appeal to a lot of different kinds of people, right? So if you're really trying to design games and, and let me say there's room for all of it, right? Like I don't think COD should be trying to, you know, attract more women necessarily. That's not, that's definitely not what I'm saying. I think that there is a, there's room for all kinds of games. There's room for a spectrum of content that's going to appeal to a real interesting mix instead of this sort of, this is a game for men, this is a game for women. Um, right. I think there's developers um, out there who are making games that appeal to a really interesting broad spectrum. I, you know, Supergiant is a fantastic example of a developer who's made content that is extremely diverse in Hades. Um, I think that you're seeing that at the AAA level with um, The Last of Us, with very diverse characters in um, in this really beautiful storytelling kind of format. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of really great examples of why it's good for business, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's sort of my bottom line here is that it's really good for business for us to consider, depending on the kind of game you're making, if you're wanting to create a game that has broader appeal or appeals to a spectrum of, of gamers or players, then doesn't it make sense to have folks like that on your team, right? Because right. then you're coming from a place of authenticity. You're coming from a place of, um, you know, lived experience and making something that really resonates with that segment, right? And who you're trying to attract into your game. And that's what I love about the game space. And that's what actually, would, I, certainly, like I said, it's not just it's not just indies, but I really do feel like indies um, are leading the way on that. And they tend to innovate in this area of diversity um, in pushing the boundaries and really showing what, what a game can be. And I love that. And I think we're seeing platforms really supporting that as well. I think Xbox is doing a fantastic job at supporting that. I think Epic is doing a fantastic job and I know they get dinged around Fortnite a lot, but honestly, I think they're doing a really, really great job of, of offering a lot of really great, um, diverse content. Great. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the, one of the reasons why I brought up the glue example is because I felt like, you know, at the executive level, it shouldn't matter whether, well, to some, uh, to a large degree, um, it shouldn't matter if the company has female focused games or not. I, th I think it showed that you can have leaders that are successful in, you know, at, at a public company, public gaming company. And so I would hope that I, I think in the glue case, it might've been that because the, because the company was focused on female oriented games, that more female executives and more, more, more females applied there. But um, I would I would think that that just kind of showed that even if there was a company that had more male focused games, that female executives should be able to be successful in in either context. Or that that would be that you know I I think that they kind of showed that 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 is very possible. And and maybe we're just you know limiting. Maybe there is some kind of bias, or we are kind of limiting the opportunities for 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 women in those kinds of companies. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so then Sarah, what, what can we do, you know, as whether as a manager or leader to encourage diversity, how can we make the game, you know, development ecosystem better? This is a question that I get from a lot of other people in the space as I'm talking to colleagues who are starting their own studios. Um, I get those those uh, DMs where they're like, hey, I'm starting a studio. I'm really struggling with finding more um, diverse candidates. Like, how do I even tackle this, right? And there's mm -hmm. sort of that sheepish, sheepishness behind it. And I think that there's more and more examples out there of studios um, of all sizes, really, who are leading the way in this and modeling this. And so my suggestion is, is like, 
first of all, like, like, let's just start with the basics. Like, what does diversity even mean to you? Right. Mm -hmm. I think the, the definition of diversity can mean very different things to different people. So how do you even level set within your company as you're deciding to, to build it? What, what does that mean? Is it dependent on location and culture and individual definitions and, and, you know, making sure that everyone's sort of on the same page with that is a really good first step. And then the next step in my mind is how are you connecting with people that you admire in the space that you perceive as doing diversity well? And I think that there's a number of studios that are really vocal and open to that kind of discussion. So Iron Galaxy, I think, is one of the shining examples of how to be leading in diversity and adopting very progressive cultural um, uh, ethos and values around how to create that. Um, you know, Adam Boys and Chelsea, they're very open to those kind of conversations, um, not to put them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that they like they they've been very vocal about that yeah. and very open to those kinds of discussions. Yeah. By the way, I met Adam in Colombia. Like this must have been five six years ago, and I was quite impressed by him. He he's he's a good dude for sure, in my opinion. Oh yeah, I had the, the absolute honor of of working with him at PlayStation, and he to this day is one of the best leaders I've ever had in my career. Awesome. For good reason. So I think you know that's a great example. Um, where I was just at at Bad Robot, you know, female-led studio, mm -hmm. extremely diverse team, um, you know, picking their brain about that, I think is is a really great way. Like, you don't have to figure this out on your own. I think that's the other right. challenge that a lot of leaders think is like, that they're sort <clears> of on their own island and they're having to figure this out themselves. It's like, no, lean into the community, right? And And mm -hmm. see who's willing to have those kind of conversations with you. Um, and then broadening your broadening your network, right? I think we all kind of get into our little bubbles of who our friends and colleagues are in the space. And if you're kind of noticing that maybe there's a lack of diversity there, is going that extra mile of, hey, I'm going to go to this convention next week, and there's this really interesting talk on diversity, and this is going to a give me a different perspective and help me learn more. And perhaps I'm being surrounded by a more diverse audience and I'll just kind of organically meet people who are not in my sphere, right? So right. doing the work around that. Um, and then I think also too, really committing to with, if you're a studio leader or a company leader is committing to that education piece and doing the work with your team. So if there's um, unconscious bias training, if there's um, a number of really, really fantastic trainings around DEIA these days, you know, language and um, inclusivity is actually going through that coursework and walking your talk around that um, is really meaningful. Um, so yeah, I, I would say there's a lot of different ways that, that you can do that, but it does require commitment and it does require um, a degree of um, prioritization. Right. And maybe a follow-up question I can ask around that is, and, and you know, feel free to call me out because, but I, I, you know, I, in the context of like a startup and that, that, that's my experience right now, trying to, you know, we're, we're in a race to achieve profitability, you know, of kind of doing our best to, to, to um, try and create a profitable organization versus like a large organization, which has already achieved profitability. And I would say at times, you know, I've thought a lot about diversity, spoken about it with other kind of um, uh, the leadership teams of other gaming studios. But um, and at times I've tried to force it where it's like, OK, for this role, I don't care. We're just going to hire female uh, because we need more diversity. And since then, I've kind of backed off. And right now, what we're doing more is to try to fix top of funnel where we say, OK, we're going to at least interview this many or as many female applicants as, as male applicants, at least. But then in the end, we'll just try and determine who the best applicant is. And we also try to um, reduce uh, bias through more like standard written assessments and things like that to, to the extent that we can and to standardize our, our questions and things like that. But at this point, I think, you know, um, 
that's basically all we're doing. And part of me is like, okay, well, we're still not super diverse. And, um, you know, I, as a startup, we've got limited resources. So maybe I'll just figure this out once we're profitable. And so please feel free to give me feedback. Is, is that a cop out? And, you know, if it is, feel free to call me out. Is there more I should be doing? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this line of thinking and, and kind of my, my own approach um, in the context of startup versus large, large company? I think it's a great question. And again, I commend you for having this kind of open and, you know, frankly, like vulnerable conversation, because I think a lot of people would be very fearful to, to admit that. And it's very much a reality is that tension between hiring people who are skilled and the best candidate and how are you driving diversity at the same time. And I think that we're all doing the best we can in circumstances that we're trying to shift and change, right? So it doesn't mean never hire a white guy again. <laughs> you know, it's it's that's that's not that's not the like that's not the lesson here. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's about like you were just saying is um, we can't have this sort of two dimensional requirement of like just hire women or just hire people of color or you know, just higher neurodiversity. I, I think it's it's about having and cultivating a diverse set of candidates, mm -hmm. right? The best we can. And so that's an ongoing thing, right? So maybe where you're at today with the diversity of your candidates is not hot. If there's the ability to um, to work towards that, to increase the diversity of candidates, to broaden your, your spectrum of candidates. I think that's a much better goal than we are, we need to hire X amount of women. Right. So I think that's, that's a really important reframe around that is, is what are you focused on? Because when you're bringing the best people across diverse candidates, then you're hiring across diverse candidates. Right. Um, and then there, you know, certainly you need to be examining unconscious bias and, and things like that. I've seen the opposite happen too, where there's a, uh, a tendency to hire our friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like, well, I'm going to, you know, give my buddy over here a chance because we're buddies and I'm going to hire them because we're buddies. And right. guess what? They ended up not being the best hire there. Right. right. Um, so I think that's, again, that's being honest with ourselves as leaders is like, I'm, I need to check my motivations here on why I'm hiring as opposed to, well, yeah, this is my buddy, but you know what candidate C over here is a better fit. And that right. means I'm going to have to go have a difficult conversation with my buddy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think we're responsible to, to, to really look at, um, how how we're making the best decisions for our company and for our business. And to me also too, it, it really boils down to values and are there clear values behind your company? You know, have you actually sat down and done a values exercise right. and how is that communicated and upheld across the team? Because I think if there is a, a value of inclusivity and belonging and, wanting to build a business that's healthy, which means inherently diverse teams. Um, I feel like that's, that's something where you're empowering everyone there to make that happen. Right. So it's not just on you as the leader, or it's not just on the leadership team. I think giving your, your team an opportunity to contribute to that, to attract diverse candidates. I I've seen that be quite successful too. And that doesn't, that doesn't require big budgets. That's the other thing too, is that I think mm -hmm. there's sort of this fallacy that you need to have all this um, budget that goes into DEIA work. And it's, um, it, that's not necessarily true. I think empowering your team and, and organic programs and organic um, uh, efforts that come out of your team can be pretty effective. Um, and so maybe I can ask you one last question, Sarah, which has to do more with 
kind of like where we are today in terms of the macro economy and the games industry today, uh, it does seem like we may potentially be in for a prolonged recession. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how the age of excess is over. We've got layoffs all over the place here in Silicon Valley, also in India. Mark Zuckerberg is pushing this narrative of 2023 is the year of efficiency, at least for Meta. But I think that's the case for many Silicon Valley companies. And, and I think just gaming studios across the board as well. Um, and so given this context and where we are, there are some leaders privately talking about shelving diversity initiatives, at least for the moment, in light of current conditions. But you know, as a business manager or leader, how should we be thinking about this diversity versus efficiency trade-off? Or is that a false trade-off? But I will say this, if we're to being real, there mm -hmm. are people who are thinking of, about it as a trade-off, right? Um, because I do think that whether it's, th there are these biases and, you know, e even I have, as an old guy, I have a bias against older people too. And, you know, I, I, I'm old, but I outwork all the young people at my company. But even then, if somebody old is applying, I'm like, uh, I know I have this bias. I'm going to give this guy a shot. But, you know, I, I do think there, I, I, even as an old person, I have a bias towards old people. Um, and so when we think about these trade-offs of diversity versus efficiency, is, is that a bias or not? Um, how, how do you think about this, uh, about the current kind of macro economy and conditions and about the potential for there to be kind of trade-offs or potentially hit to diversity because of the way we think about it? <laughs> I love that you're calling yourself out on the ageism piece. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm also not a spring chicken, um, and and that's something that that I'm very cognizant of in in technology and games is being a woman of a certain age and the um, the stigmas attached to that. Uh, and I think women face a lot of stigmas if they choose to have children, um, if if they're making decisions that there's a perception it's it's affecting their ability to do their job. Uh, yeah, I think calling ourselves out is really important. And, and again, it's not about saying, oh, I, I, I have no bias. I have, you know, I need to get to a place where I'm perfect and there's no bias. Like, yeah, newsflash, we all have biases. Like right. that, that's, just, yep. that's just the human condition. So really recognizing that and then making that choice to override that is um, is the really important piece there. So my, I would say that as companies are navigating really challenging economic headwinds, big changes in gaming, big changes in technology, I mean, it's more difficult than ever to launch and operate and run a game. The expectations are so high it's it's always been a hits driven business right and and it's just it's more difficult than ever before so i think you could arguably say that there's all sorts of things that need to be cut back on or efficiencies need to be created and i don't think that's a bad thing i think that you can look at something like diversity or even um culture building or um uh health and wellness or well-being of your team and looking at, okay, well, you know, we used to dedicate X amount of dollars towards this. We just simply don't have the funds. How do we get creative, right? How do we still hold this as a priority or still hold this as something that's part of our values as a company? And how do we get more scrappy about it? How do we get more creative about it? And that's where I go back to what I was saying previously of lean into the wisdom and the brilliance of your team. I think giving people and empowering people uh, to run with ideas and giving them constraints will actually create some pretty cool innovation that will still keep diversity, DIA work, inclusion, belonging, 
in that list of priorities. So that would be my counter to that is that it doesn't, it's not at all or nothing. Right. And I, I kind of like the way that you framed it earlier in terms of, is, is it part of the values of your company? Because if that's the case, then it shouldn't be viewed as a cost or a trade-off. If this is one of the, the, you know, the principles upon which you believe your company is going to be successful longer term, then um, it should be part of your company's operating system to some degree. And to your point, there may be things, it, it, like not everything has to be a tremendous cost. You know, thinking about biases, having open discussions about it and things like that, if I'm hearing you correctly, those are things that, you know, you can do without, you know, without having to spend a ton of money or hire external consultants or, you know, have, have big spend on. Um, yes, but, exactly. Cool. Okay. Well, Sarah, I, I want to thank you for your time for all of your, your wisdom and, and experience as somebody who's been there and fought the battle and, and been in the industry for a long time. And so maybe we could just end with, um, if there are, if anyone wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do that? And uh, if you have a final message for our audience. Uh, thank you so much. This has been really such a joy to have this conversation. I know it's a difficult conversation for a lot of people and I love that we've been having it. And I'm really excited to hear other people's thoughts as you release this. Uh, so everyone, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty prolific on LinkedIn. I'm constantly writing over there. So if you ever want to reach out, feel free. Um, that's really the, the main way uh, to get a hold of me. And I guess my final thoughts would be, let's just have these discussions. Let's make space for these discussions as long as folks are coming to the table with humility, curiosity, the willingness to learn and for greater understanding, let's, let's talk about the hard stuff. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much for that final message. Thank you for your time and for our audience. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.